Hello, welcome to uh, this webinar. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you for the panelists, uh, but also to um, the attendees for, for joining us. So over the next hour, um, we're going to present the, um, the results of some research that we did into uh, modern reputational risks. And with me, I have a distinguished panel of uh, experts that are going to talk through the sort of implications and um, their experience with with these types of um, uh, with these findings. So maybe we can just do a sort of round table starting right to left and ask my panelists please to introduce themselves. Nancy, starting with you, please. Sure. Hi everybody, I'm Nancy Brennan. I'm in the corporate reputation practice at MSL. I am the US lead for crisis and issues management. And I have about 35 years of strategic communications experience, but my job right now is to help companies see around corners to prepare and preempt crises. And when they do hit, help them um, preserve reputation and find opportunities to lead. Brilliant, thank you. David Peter. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is David Peter. I'm a senior consultant at Ewald and Ressing. Uh, we are an agency located in Germany and um, we provide crisis management, crisis communication and crisis trainings to our clients. And we've been in the field for over 20 years. Um, and yeah, we will help uh, our clients when they are in trouble. Brilliant. Laura. Hi everybody, my name is um, Laura Garcia. I'm originally from Mexico, but now I live in the UK and I work for a nonprofit called First Draft. And what we do is research disinformation and help to build resilience in communities, whether it's journalists or nonprofits or corporations against false and misleading and potentially harmful information. Brilliant, and David Rubens, please. Hi everybody, um, I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Strategic Risk Management. Uh, my background is in um, complex organizations com operating in complex environment um, and specifically with, with high level um, modeling and preparing for and engaging with high level um, and highly disruptive crisis events. Brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Robert Bratton. I'm the uh, CEO and um, founder of Conductor and um, we are a crisis simulation uh, vendor, so we we sell software, and we've conducted this research in order to understand the pressures that our customers are under to make sure that we develop the platform um, in line with what their requirements are. And uh, uh, this next slide is just a bit cheeky to say we won the Queen's Award for in, for innovation this year. So, <laughs> right, um, the survey population, um, the we um, we asked a hundred. Uh, senior PR and comms professional uh, in the UK that were working for big companies. Uh, so we defined big as more than 500 employees um, and with a turnover in 250 million. And we specifically directed the questions to um, comms and PR leaders, uh, VP director of comms um, and PR. And it was really, it was really interesting the, uh, the results. <clears throat> When, when, um, when, so, so when the, the survey come back, and what we're going to do is go through some of those using this current slide as, um, as a structure for that. Because what we, what we see now is there's these five forces um, that are really impacting the organization. And you see at the top and bottom, we have these technological and societal shifts, which are creating um, new sort of threats basically or, or it's, it's exacerbating threats that might have been there before and across that center we see that we've got activist threats so people that are neither customers nor or employees that are looking to sort of co-opt the organization co-opt the brand into their um into their narrative into, into their sort of thing that they're aggrieved about then inside the company we have um, so we've called it insider threats and, and often um, we think about that as purely cyber, but I'm using it here to mean any kind of employee activism, somebody who's disgruntled and, um, you know, basically wants to tell the world about that. And uh, the other one is the consumer uh, threats, you know, people who buy your products who, uh, who have an issue. So, yeah, we're going to use this sort of structure to go through the, 
through the presentation. And um, I'm hoping that I'm going to talk the least, but what I'm going to do is set up each topic area and then invite my panelists to, to discuss that. So when we look at societal shifts, what, what I feel nowadays is that um, there's a large um, group of people who feel that the normal political process doesn't really work for them. There's a lot of people that feel disenfranchised with the, let's say, the official channels of complaint or the official way to, to see change happen. And what's happening is they're basically taken to the streets. Um, there's, there's certainly a group of people that are very uh, quick to take offence and quick to actually do something about the frustration or the dissatisfaction they, they feel. And they're, and they're less inclined to use what might be, you know, we might call the formal channels. So what we found was that um, of the people we surveyed, 77% agreed that their brand is at risk from activists and conspiracy theorists. Uh, I think in the last couple of years, conspiracy theory, although they've always been around and they've been a bit of a kind of giggle, now they really, you know, seem to be posing a serious uh, threat to everyone. And across the bottom, we've got the employee activism and the consumer activism with 65% of respondents saying that they've had to respond to an employee um, activist crisis and 57% saying that um, uh, you know they've had to respond to consumers uh, activism so uh, Nancy if, if I could I'll start with you mm -hmm. I mean this survey was done in the UK how does it how does, does it ring true with the US well what I can say is that there is no question that stakeholder activism is on the rise at the US in the US um, and when you think about it, the motivations really run the gamut. There's increased environmental activism, increased financial activism, but there has been a bit tremendous focus in the last couple of years on political and social activism. I mean, it's hard to talk about this and not think about the US having just gone through one of the most chaotic and contentious elections in our history. And there was activism and disinformation on both sides of that of that um, election. Um, when you think of social activism, just look at the force of the Black Lives Matter movement, not only in the US, but the, the, the ripples around the world on that and its, and its impact. And, and right now in the US, when you think about it, um, you can see these two forces, political and social, and even financial and environmental, they're all merging. Um, there is growing activism around voting rights in the United States, if anybody outside is following, which is essentially about legislation, state, state level legislation, but is very much connected to a concern about voter suppression and particularly in minority communities. So you see this merging of social and political um, activism. But what I would say, and I want to add here, it's really hard to have this discussion and just think about this from the outside forces infect, uh, affecting brands and consumers, because what you've also seen in the US in the last couple of years is you've seen a dramatic shift in the way companies think about their position and their responsibility in the community. Um, a definition of corporate purpose has changed in the US, and rather than simply focused on the primacy of the shareholder, many companies have now moved to recognizing their obligation to a variety of stakeholders. So in many cases, you have companies for the first time taking stands and putting themselves out there. And clearly there's more risk involved with that, that communities and different communities will respond to that. So I would say all in all, it's a cauldron in the US when it comes to activism, so yes. Yeah, quite, quite close to the UK then in that, uh, yeah. in that, probably maybe like a little bit, maybe a little bit ahead of us, but uh, we're on our we're on the same trajectory for sure. I, I would say, uh, David, Peter, how does it how does it look in uh, in Germany? Yeah, I think um, the US and the UK are ahead of Germany <laughs> concerning mm -hmm. these uh, developments. Um, we also see an uh, increase in uh, employee and consumer activism over the last years, absolutely, and also concerning uh, conspiracy theorists especially with Corona. Uh, we had a lot of um, uh, problems in the last year with um, 
political activism, people going on the streets saying this is all a fake, this is uh, the, the rise doesn't exist, uh, things like that. Um, that is a problem. And within these uh, movements, also companies get targeted. Uh, for uh, instance, BioNTech, that is uh, mm. the company uh, behind the Pfizer uh, vaccine uh, also in Germany, that's hardly targeted by political activists. Um, but generally speaking, if you are thinking about outside um, the, the pandemic situation, I think that it's compared to U UK and the US, it's not that big of a problem at the moment. So the threat level is a bit lower. Um, and I think the, the reason for that is mostly because um, German companies, um, the, the structure is differently. We have a lot of SMEs, we had a lot of family owned companies, and we had a, have a lot of companies that are B2B. So they don't produce anything for the end customer and so they are not that of a target for most uh, consumer activists groups because they would have to explain why this company matters to me in my everyday life if i have never heard of it it will be very different uh, to uh, to to um, convince me going onto the streets and protesting against that company um so i think um they're still a bit behind, but definitely the the um, um, development is on the rise also in Germany. And you were you were saying before when we we spoke about the the demographics of people on social media on Twitter particularly is is different from uh, the UK and the US. Yeah, I said that um, that might be an interesting um, side topic here because um, when I look in the US, everybody uh, or it, for me it's, it seems like everybody's on Twitter, for instance. Mm -hmm. And in Germany, it's quite different. In Germany, you have a lot of um, journalists and a lot of politicians being on Twitter, but it's definitely not uh, the average Joe that is on Twitter in Germany. So if you want to uh, get your aunt <laughs> to contact your aunt, you will go on Facebook. That is the platform most of the people are on. But Twitter is a very specialized group used um, to that platform. Yeah. OK, so David, David Rubens, what, you know, what um, can organizations do to manage this sort of these threats? Oh, so no, no soft opening up question from you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, no, I knew no you could take it, maybe. <laughs> I didn't think you was one for small talk. I just went straight no, for clearly it. Clearly not. Clearly not. Um, <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, the thing about it is, there is no magic, and there there is no voodoo. Um, you got you got to have your processes in place. I think the first thing you've got to have is. You've got to have a sensitivity to the environment you're operating in. You know, you've got to have a, a feel. I, I think there's a Fingerspitzgefühl in German. Would you say that, David? Fingerspitzgefühl or something? The, the, the feeling at the, the tips of your fingers that you know that you, that you, that you, you have a sensitivity to what's going on. And I think in the modern, of course, in the modern era, it's instantaneous. I mean, you can go, you know, you can you, by the time you wake up in the morning and open up your your email or your your phone. It could have happened to you, um, and so and so you have to have that sort of fast reaction, fast reactive response. Um, the, tr the truth of the matter is that it is an unmanaged, an unstructured environment. You know, you can't control it. You can't even influence to a certain extent. All you can do is try and protect what you do. You have to do what you do best, and often that's telling the truth. That's that. You know, that's that's telling the truth. It's coming out, it's trying to take ownership of the narrative um, and, and having the confidence to, you know, to move forward. I think that when organizations fail, it's not because of the external messaging so much, but it is the internal failure to respond effectively to the messaging. Um, and once, basically a new, any news story will have three parts. This is what happened. This is what is happening. This is a response. Why isn't management good enough? Why isn't our political management good enough? Why isn't our corporate management strong enough? And if by tomorrow morning, the first question is, why is management failing? You will never recover. That, that then becomes the story. Um, and so I think it's to, 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 to a large extent you start trying to take ownership of the narrative from your own perspective. Okay. And I. So, Laura, I know that you are an expert in disinformation and uh, conspiracies. Uh, so, I'm going to give you your own slide. I'm going to move on, and but um, but then I'm going to come back to you uh, first. 
So I'm when we change my Twitter bio to that expert in conspiracies. <laughs> <laughs> so when um, so when we look at the technological um, shifts, what I see is that everybody now has the potential to be an influencer. You know, a, a lot of people are very familiar with the way that um, social media works, with the way that they can um, gain access to other influencers who might be, you know, might have bigger followings to like amplify uh, their message. And I also see that, like, like if, you, if you think about what motivates people, the in, intrinsic motivations are things like mastery, um, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, mastery, connection to other people and uh, getting significance. And social media and activism, you know, appeals to all of these, uh, all all of these things. And of course, we're we're so so much more connected now that it can that it can spread really uh, quickly. So when we so when we looked at the impact of of the, some of this technology when combined with the uh, the social changes, we see that 43% say that deep fakes and social media pose their biggest challenge. 31% say new threats from disinformation are, are, are a top challenge. And 77% agree that their brand is at risk. I guess that's a repeat of before, but it's worth sort of uh, showing it again. So, so Laura, maybe maybe you could explain a little bit about what disinformation is and how it, how it comes about. Yeah, definitely. I think it's important that we set a distinction between disinformation and things that people are saying about a company that you maybe don't like, because those two things are a little bit different. And and it speaks to the nature of the fragmented yet networked audience that we are all speaking to, which is what um, the previous speakers were talking about, how this idea of it's very easy for things to spread wildly and for people to share it. And sometimes we forget that in the end, we're still talking about people. And if we make an analogy to how this would happen in the offline world, you're talking about how rumors would spread between villages. And what you're looking for is understanding how your audience is at the same time networked and fragmented to see how this disinformation might spread. Now, why does this information spread? Because people spread it. There's bots exist, like coordinated activity exists, but the real propeller behind information is people because we share it with each other. And that comes and boils down to a really hard pill to swallow for someone like me who comes from journalism that our relationship to information is emotional we relate to the things that appeal to our identity to the tribes that we belong to to the belongings that we feel a part of and we act that out online and on social media and in the things that we share with each other and that means that whenever you're either as a journalist or as a company trying to deal with information it's a little bit more helpful from how we see it and our dealings with this information. If you shift it from you're trying to correct facts, you're actually trying to build trust or rebuild trust or regain trust. Because that is more about that emotional connection that you have with your audience and that they have with you and the information you're trying to present to them. And that's kind of the main driver of it. Things spread when they're shocking or funny or outrageous or have all the emojis in the end and it's because it makes us people not think before we share it and we share it as an act of identity and an expression to the tribes and the communities we belong to i think is i mean i think as well one of the um things i've picked up from first draft uh, before is this idea of like the information gap where you know something happens and there's this there's this kind of void where the conspiracy theorists will rush to fill it before maybe the brand or the you know like let's say they, the owner and um, maybe there's something you know to say about being first to respond or being able to get out there with something to dispel um, any sort of rumors or disinformation before the conspiracy theorists can get out. Oh yeah human beings were curious and we are going to try and find answers. And the thing about the internet is that it's an infinite repository of information. So when something happens and people have questions, I guarantee you they are going to find answers, but they not, might oh, yeah. not be good ones. And they're going to be someone's YouTube and a blog and a podcast. And, and that information vacuum just makes people find other answers rather than credible verified information, for sure. Robert, yeah, I read... I read one, uh, it's, it's a couple of years old now, but I read one study that said 70% of 
retweets on Twitter are false information. And the reason why people retweet them is because they're interesting to, to Laura's point or novel or exciting. Um, and so uh, you, you can imagine how that drives um, saturation yeah. and, and read. So. I mean, and I, I bet you something. not a lot of those people. Oh, sorry, Robert, go, go, go. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I was, just, I was just talking rubbish about, I see stuff in my like WhatsApp group and you go like, mate, that's rubbish, quite obviously. Like if you look at the photo, or, you know, whatever. But people do share it because they, they just think it's fun. Yeah, and you, you pointed out something really interesting, which is this is beyond just news or stories. We use the term fake news as a catch for everything, but it really is built through the memes, the images, the podcasts, the YouTube videos, the stuff that shares really quickly through closed messaging apps. And to Nancy's point, which is excellent and amazing, I, I wonder how many of those people actually click through to read what they're retweeting or are they reacting to 280 characters in an image that they feel speaks, them retweeting it says something about themselves. Yeah, I, I agree. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna move it on because to that, you know, I think what's interesting is this idea that you know, consumers now realize that they've got quite a lot of power over the brands. Um, and I wonder, Nancy, you know, what does this mean for your clients? What are you telling them about this, this power hungry, these power hungry consumers? It, it, what we say is it, it means they can't have a future built on transactional relationships, that they need to focus, that brands and companies need to focus on building trust um, by connecting on shared values and through transparency. Um, you have to be consumer obsessed, know what they think and connect on things that are real. Um, it means that they need to walk the walk and talk the talk when they say something. Um, that's how you build trust. Um, and it needs, it means that they always need to be listening and prepared. Um, while you can't always control every situation what you can do i mean at the same time we have these new channels that allow that give everyone access we have a democratized you know democratized media essentially um we also have the advantage of having that data to help us understand our consumers and what they're thinking and what they're doing earlier so staying close to them and a ear on the ground helps you stay prepared and know what's know important what's coming. I right. was thinking it's, as well, know what's coming if you start to see right. people getting exactly. agitated about something. Yes. I think that David Rubens, you was you was saying to me before, like it's really important for the brand to be authentic because um, you know, if you're not, you're gonna try to straddle too many chairs. It, it is you I think it's you, you look at your core, you look at what well, the thing about it is it's um the famous phrase, it's all about integrity. If you can fake that, you've got it made. Um, so the problem is that a lot of organisations, you know, they're, they're green, they're green, they're going green or whatever it might be. And you see, you see all companies going green, and yet deep under, it's basically another marketing ploy. Um, I, I think this comes back to what Nancy was talking about about sort of listening to your people and having a connection. Um, the truth of all business nowadays, anybody who does business in 2021, I don't think there's a single person in the world who does business in 2021. Like they did business in 2019, I just don't think it's impossible. I think it is different. Um, and so, from our perspective, the truth is, you don't do business; you build relationships. And if you have a relationship, then the opportunity for business is there. Which is not actually that difficult to say or to understand. Um, and I'll come back to that. The, the outstanding example of people, you know, very, very smart people getting it very, very wrong, is the European Super League, the Soccer Super League. <laughs> um, when you had some really smart and very rich and very successful people just not understand, because a lot of them were far away, so had them in the States or somewhere else, and they did not understand what was being, being spoken about. JP Morgan, you know, was funding it. You know, Jamie Dimon is many things, but he's not stupid. You know, he, he's got a good track record. He got it wrong on this one. Man United this week, Manchester United, lost a 10 year, 200 million pound sponsorship package purely because of that. And the organization that we're going to be sponsoring, basically having the name on their training kit, says we do not want to be associated with this and walked away. So it's a lot of times it's, it's smart people getting pretty damn stupid decisions, but those decisions have 
consequences. And then you come to the point of, well, how quickly can you recover? How quickly are you aware that this is, you know, this is wrong? Let's get it back again. And most organisations are not really good at that. They're not good at pivoting. I know. I would say we're the super league. It was embarrassing how quickly they turned it around. Like, so you didn't even think this through. <laughs> You didn't guess that that was going to be the reaction. That's Cut their losses and go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just moving on from that, the other, you know, almost like the, I don't know about the flip side, but but sort of a consequence of this power that the consumers know they have is this idea of cancel culture. The idea that, you know, so often it's thought of about like maybe like a minority, but certainly a very um, activist group of people want to boycott a brand or they want to ostracize and delist um you know somebody and i wonder david is this a is this a thing in germany or um yes i would say it's it's a thing and it's getting bigger um i think we it's not that f long that we have this this term in germany and um, activists doing that kind of um, activism in, in germany i think it's mostly targeted um at uh, individuals so it's uh, comedians actors scientists that are cancelled um <clears throat> We also had one client, a uh, scientist of a university, that uh, what was targeted by uh, a cancel culture activism group. And um, but it's not a problem for companies in the way that the CEO of a company is cancelled, at least not in Germany. So I don't know how, how the situation is in the UK or the US. I think that's also again maybe. Um, Something that has to do with the, the the fact that German CEOs or German leaders of companies they they tend not to take a position uh, in social media uh, in uh, controversial topics, so they are not they they don't give any target for that. So that might be the case why they are not targeted by cancel culture activism. Yeah, whereas in um, in uh, America, of course, I think the consumers expect the CEOs to take a stand, and I mean. Nancy, what what does it mean for for the brand? I mean, you, you're going to have to decide then. Okay, we're not going to be popular with a certain group of people because this these are our brand values, and we're going to stick by them. I, I mean, I I think in today's world, there that brands and companies in many cases don't have an opportunity to sit on the sidelines anymore. It, you know, at least in the U.S., um, stakeholder expectations have changed. Um, they expect you to be clear about your values and stand for something. That doesn't mean you need to weigh in on everything, but you do need to live those values and be prepared for the backlash. Um, I, you know, um, I think there, you know, no good deed goes unpunished, right? In some cases, right? I mean, the, the reality is there is nothing you can do that won't get feedback, both positive and negative. And I think that's a new reality for the C-suite that they have to understand in the U.S. and they're they're learning through and evolving through. In that, um, the expectation is you will stand for something. Um, I was going to say in the U.S. Just on the other slide, it, you know. What happens is while brands don't necessarily become canceled, what we do face, and it's a point of leverage and much of the activism is that they face boycotts. Um, and th that kind of action um, by larger communities is the way that brands and companies in many cases can feel pain, at least reputationally, if not financially. So, but- um, it, it, you know, today, um, you know, you have to think about in this slide um, who you do have relationships with when you identify a group, an organization, or an outside influencer that you want your brand or company to connect with and, and assure that you share the same set of values. And so it's preparation. Yeah. I mean, on, the, on this slide, this is a very UK uh centric example so the chancellor of the exchequer uh dishy rishi was photographed or photographed himself with some tetley tea obviously trying to um you know project his kind of working class credentials because he wasn't like twining's lemon and ginger or something like that so but then what happened was um social media erupted and sort of started um you know criticizing yorkshire tea for supporting the tory government and they're like well he can buy tea bags just like anybody can buy tea bags. It's not like an endorsement from us. 
So I think in that case, it was, you know, I would say fairly easily sort of cleared up. But it's an example where you have a certain group of people that want to bring in the brand because they can help amplify their message. So you don't even you don't even need to be going out there, you know, taking a stand. Someone might just bring you in um, just just because it's going to be more newsworthy. So I'm just keeping an eye on the time. And so this is another um, set of information. I, I don't know what the guys think about this, but like 78 percent of the people that we uh, interviewed felt like their brand is becoming, their brand reputation is becoming un, unmanageable. And they worry, yeah, you know, 43 percent worry about these defamatory images and viral videos. And another 30 percent say it's, you know, they just don't have the capacity to detect them uh, quickly enough. Laura, when you're when you're working with um, your your clients, what do you what do you say to them about reacting quickly or you know be, you know being able to respond to defamatory memes and images? What should they do? The really delicate balance of learning when to speak up and how to do it so that you don't necessarily calm the fire. And it kind of goes back to something that I think Nancy said at the beginning, listening is key to all of this because when you're the person at the back end of a Twitter account that's getting a hundred mentions every five minutes, it feels like the world is falling upon you. But if you take a step back and you look and you think, right, who is my community? Who is the audience I'm trying to build trust with? Maybe these hundred mentions a minute aren't necessarily those people. So it doesn't really matter. And me intervening quickly without thinking how to do it might make it worse. And our, our kind of advice when it comes to disinformation, which I think applies to this as well, is to do something called a truth sandwich. So um, you start with the truth, lead with the facts. Don't ask the question, for example, does um, drinking tea cure coronavirus? Lead with what we know for sure. Warn your audience before you're gonna repeat the falsehood that you're talking about. Repeat it, but then explain why it's false. Never just leave, again, a vacuum of information if just say, well, that's not true. Okay, why? <laughs> yeah, and then repeat yeah. the fact at the end because repetition helps us remember stuff and also because of the way that we consume stuff on our phones. People might read the top and scroll down to the bottom of the story and you're better off them reading the fact twice than reading a question that leaves a vacuum of information and then maybe not being able to read through to the rest. And the same goes for stuff on social and headlines. We have very few sessions, like seconds to get that story right. So always lead with the fact. And I think David Rubin said it earlier and sometimes that means owning up to something and that mm -hmm. might be hard but it's it's the better outcome in the long run because again you're not talking about countering facts you're talking about building trust thank um, you really good this i'm trying i'm just trying to cut who laura i'm sure you know Nancy, i'm sure you know who's the, who's president biden's female press secretary who who, who gives the, the conference jen Stanky, jen she Sorry. is excellent. She is, in my opinion, I actually follow her. I should know her name, shouldn't I? Because I think she's so good at she answering is. right accusations. And she, she doesn't get excited. She just says, no, you're wrong. And this is why. She, everything you said, Laura, she, she brings to the game. And if anybody wants to see how you do it properly, she's, I, I think she's wonderful. You can also play a different game. Um, and one of the outstanding examples of brand management was KFC Kentucky Fried Chicken when they run out of chicken. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. you, know, the is smaller, you know about it, but as a case study in breaking the box and just going crazy, you know, why did the chicken cross the road? It didn't. We don't have any chicken. Or you know, or, well, they basically had a bunch of kids and they were just saying, "Mate, screwed up." But they turned it into a joke. It became really popular. They re again they regained the narrative of it. Now you've got to be very, very careful with humour because humour can go get you know the idea that you're not taking it seriously mm. is the worst yeah, thing yeah. that can happen. You've got to be very, very careful with humour. But if you get it right, it can really change the narrative com com completely. And anybody who's interested in seeing how somebody's basically taken it out of the box and really, really turned it around, Kentucky Fried Chicken is a fantastic case study to see that. <laughs> in in the UK, there's 
I was going to say, I made me think of the, the Royal Academy of the Arts in the UK did something really interesting when first lockdown hit. They are publicly funded when people stop going to museums, like all museums everywhere, they really started to struggle. And what they did was they tapped in with empathy to the situation that we're all in and realized we're all trapped at home, we're all bored. They understood the language of social media and their account has grown so much because they started doing daily drawing challenges. Draw mm -hmm. what you see out the window, show us your doodles. On your one hour daily walk, draw a shoe that you see on the road and just with humor, but from a place of empathy. And it's very similar to what you're describing that KFC did is understanding and also gauging the seriousness of the problem, right? <laughs> this chicken is not the same as your CEO has suddenly been involved in something horrific and, and where you find that balance. I just want to go back to something that kicked off me because of course, this is not new. I mean, this has happened forever. I mean, for example, in 2001, McDonald's changed French fries into peace fries because the French came out against the coalition, you know, of the winning in, in, in Iraq. So this is not you. You know, you know, brand management and brand danger is not is not a new thing by, by any means. But I think what's changed is the instantaneous and the global impact of it and the uncontrollability of it. But also, I think the weaponization of it, because, you know, there are people out there that want to destabilize society, eh, foreign adversaries, and they're looking for an opportunity to um, stir the pot and get people all, all fighting against each other. And I, I wonder if there more could be done, you know, in sort of media literacy with people just realizing when they're being wound up, where someone's actually trying to uh, stir them to action and they should just step back. I guess that's what you would say, Laura, just take a moment. Is, is someone trying to provoke me, <laughs> trying to trigger me? And I sh I'm actually going to not do something. I'm going to just go the other way. It's it's a very... Yeah. Go, go, go ahead, Nancy. Go. Mm -mm. go ahead. <laughs> no, I was going to say that we, at First Draft, we're kind of taking the long view with it, and we're trying to think of media literacy as a public health campaign, just like it took decades for people to just put on a seatbelt because it's a normal thing to do, and just like don't drink and drive is a thing. Like, don't retweet when you're angry. That should be our next frontier. Just don't do it. And the other thing is we need oh, to have conversations. Yeah, and we need to have conversations about how these spaces that we treat as information providers are not. They're commercial enterprises who learn from what we like and give us more of it. And I think that part of the conversation sometimes is left out. And we need to keep reminding ourselves that we exist in echo chambers and filter bubbles. Um, and like, and that means that some of us have to help educate up to some of the older people in our lives. And some of us have to educate down to some of the younger people in our lives. So we all get a better understanding of that. Brilliant. I think, I mean, that moves us on to what is effectively the sort of the last slide, which looks at the issue of training. Um, and you can see these figures here that, you know, 84% of the respondents say they're least confident in fighting cancel culture, similar sort of number, you know, in fighting uh, fake news. And yet when you look at the training, um, you know, 40%, they don't have any regular training in that area. 34% uh, is kind of a bit ad hoc. And um, David Rubens, I'll go to you. What, you know, what do you think about these percentages and the fact that not many people are training for it? I'm not surprised. Um, but in my experience as somebody who's been involved in training for over 30 years, um, if you go to organizations and say, well, let's do some training, they want to understand why and what the benefit is and what they can do afterwards. So you, you've got to keep it very, very clear. And I think with this stuff, a lot of times people don't know. People just don't understand what's happening. They don't understand how they can engage with it. And they don't understand why will we be better if we do your training, all of which are challenges. So I think that if they're not doing that, then the fault is on the trainer side. It is on our side of the table, the fault, that we are not making the case because we believe that what we have is important and significant and critical and necessary and worthwhile and beneficial. And if we as communicators cannot get that message across in such a way that it is brought by the other side, then the fault is with us, not with them. Um, and so I think that that um, you know that phrase uh, uh, literacy is, is is actually where it's at. Um, I think it's become increasingly critical. But I had an American uh, investor who I was looking after, and he was coming into, this, into the UK looking at um, 
technological com technology companies to buy basically i mean the two to five million pound mark and the first three he went to he walked out he says i'm not interested i said why he says because their chief information officer is 56 years old i want a chief information <laughs> officer who's 23 years old and if your chief information officer is 56 years old mate can't be bothered there's nothing there for me that is a terrible <laughs> generalization <laughs> As it's someone in the autumn of his years, uh, it's shocking. It's, 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 a <laughs> young it's going to be fast, you've got to be agile, you've got to be on the game, you've got to be up to the minute, all of those things. Because let's face it, the cyber threats we will be facing in the next two, in two years' time don't even exist yet. They don't even exist. And so who are the people who are going to be able to move fast enough to manage that? It ain't 56 year olds. I don't know. I, I would I would beg to differ on that. It, it wasn't my company you came into, but <laughs> but David David and Nancy, how do you train your clients for these kind of new types of threats? I mean, we 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 talk to them a lot about the fact that one, they are new threats, and two, there has to be a di new decision making process to manage in a different environment, right? You know. Um, we've talked about long gone are the days when you used to have that, you know, big, thick crisis manual that sat on your shelf and, you know, turned to page 456 to see what to do about this. It, it doesn't work that way, um, not with the, all the technological shifts. So um, we talked to them about the need to understand the new situation and to be able to respond and react quickly. Um, and to have experience doing that. You know, I've read a lot about how the, the pandemic showed a lot of C-suite and senior executives that they really need to practice um, connecting with other leadership to make the right decisions quickly and that they need to reassess how they go about decision making. Um, and it brought it to life for many. But um, we talk about that. Um, and we encourage them to reset. And, and clearly it's looking at a new set of vulnerabilities and how it works and defining how they make decisions and who makes those decisions. And a good part of that is practicing because um, you can talk about it till you're blue in the face, but you have to actually feel as if you're in the moment to see if those systems work. So that's how we generally talk about it. Absolutely. How about you, David Payo? Yeah, yeah. I also think that it's uh, most important that a client uh, has um, an experience that is uh, as close to the real world as possible. So that is uh, how we approach trainings. Because as you said, Nancy, uh, the the crisis handbook is the first thing you will totally ignore. Uh, that's the, <laughs> the, the, the absolute last thing you will take in your hands and think about using this is is the crisis handbook. That is not usable at all uh, from our experience and. Um, so we uh, really try to to do trainings that have a real world appearance um and and that is also i can totally relate to what you said david um concerning clients need to understand why they should train in the first place and that is also really a problem because usually they they call us when it's too late when the crisis already happened or um, if they are in the lucky position to know that next week they they will have a crisis because there is some court a decision to be done or so and then they will think about doing a training but when we came up to to clients saying hey won't you train uh, on social media shitstorms now or cancel culture things uh, and, and then say hey no why why so it's very hard to yeah to get the the um to talk about the need of making a training in the first place I wonder if sometimes people, particularly if we're talking about reputational crises, if they think, oh, well, that's just purely something that happens online rather than, you know, understanding that that can become an operational issue and, it, you know, it can restrict your ability to move and do all kinds of things. So it's, it's not just a purely digital domain issue. Yes. Well, can I come here for a second just just say something about what, what David was saying? Because, of course, training is not an isolated thing you do training. Training is part of an organisational capability development is part of you know, this banner it's the question is not what we need to do it's who do we want to become you know what is what you know what does good look like as far as we're concerned and in my experience many many organizations and unfortunately many people selling training misunderstand that they come in and they say well we'll say we'll say will you do a tabletop exercise well yeah we'll do that so 
you don't know who they are. I mean, you don't know what their risk register is. You don't know what their, their maturity is. You don't know who their critical people are. To so come in and just do a tabletop exercise for three hours on a Thursday afternoon, not sure where the meaning is. And so if we can show that this is part of a, a an ongoing development process that is not isolated, but is incremental moving in a certain direction to where we wish to be, then it is not isolated, but it is embedded because it has to be habituated. And to come back to the point that David says about, you know, there's no point, you know, having the crisis management program. What you do is you revert back to what you do. A crisis management program should not say, this is what you need to do. A crisis management program should look at what you do and then say, well, how do we put a structured framework around that to allow you to do that more effectively? Because whatever the crisis management program says, you will do that. And so I think that we have to have an understanding that we probably need to get a bit more sophisticated, well, actually a lot more sophisticated in our understanding of actually what we are offering to, for, from my perspective, complex organizations. And often the, the, the sophistication of what we're offering is not up to speed with the, the needs of the sophistication of the organization or, or, you know, or of what they require from us. We're basically being very simplistic. And therefore, we're not living up to our own ideals of, you know, honesty and integrity and relationships because we're not offering it from our side. That's interesting. The, the, the other thing that I would say is training also, when you can encourage a client to do regular training, it often makes them, and this is an important part of that, and it speaks to what you're saying, David, do that reflection, be very self-reflective to understand what is gonna trigger action for them to really dig deep into their values and understand what is going to push them to, what are they willing to make a sacrifice for? What are they willing to really stand up for? And I think that is part, that's an inherent benefit of preparation is that really getting those senior executives to think about, okay, what will we respond to and what will we not respond to? Because to, in today's environment, um, there aren't just periodic threats or explosions. It's a chaotic environment where there's a constant level of threat and a constant level of response, either required or not required. So I think that's that's an, another important part of why prep and training is so important because that's part of it. Absolutely. And Laura, your exercises are incredibly realistic, aren't they? You, you know, people actually do their job, kind of, it feels like that. Yeah, well, just trying to talk to, just trying to get me to talk about conductor and how we use it to simulate um, online crisis simulations, which is really cool. But it, but it's true though, managing and responding quickly when you're on the spot, whether you're a journalist covering a story or you're managing the reputation of a company, takes practice. You need to do it so it's muscle memory and so everyone knows what they're supposed to do at what time so that you can respond as quickly as possible in a way that also leaves pause for reflection. And there's no way to replicate that than by replicating it. It's like hostile environment training or vaccines. They're good because they teach your body what to look out for and how to respond. Then it means the level of threat when you actually see it and the possible repercussions go down. And we we face that same challenge that you guys have been describing of, of explaining to newsrooms why they need training even after they've just done something that we would class as horrific in our books and it's still hard because it's a time investment and it's a money investment and no one has time and no one wants to think about it and particularly when it's social media depending on the organization that you're talking to it's this thing that the digital people do it's this thing that the young people do like david was saying it's the thing that the 20 somethings do when really it's just one more frontier of where your audiences collect. It's like the town plaza or the church square. It's, we just have to learn and, and never forget that those two coexist, right? The real world still exists, even if a lot of it, we see it mediated through screens. And if you don't deal with it properly, the people that are in the digital plaza are gonna come in physically in the real plaza right outside your offices or, or something. Yeah, and we also depends what your organization is like. If you're dealing in places with um, less internet penetration or less connectivity, sometimes this is the only way that people access the internet. And it means that you add on to that, that for example, news sites sometimes are paywalled. It means that sometimes the only place they get information is social media. Some particular phone companies in different parts of the world 
wave the data usage for things like WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. So how are people going to share information in spaces that don't cost them anything, right? And you add onto that that they're there with friends and family, who is people that they trust, and this stuff spreads like wildfire. So I think we have to we have to look beyond social as this like cute thing that young people do and it's more it's a space where audiences have conversations and it depends where your audience is and what conversations you need to be a part of what you need to be aware of and know how it's happening and keep on top of that and of course you now, you now have malicious actors i mean you have specific malicious actors whether state actors or state sponsored actors yeah. you know who are, they're, they're not just nasty bugs they're, they're things that are coming after you they're nasty and bugs. And, and think about this, this is another fun fact, or not so fun fact. It, uh, the Pew Research Center after the recent election in the US found that one in five Americans gets their new, primarily gets their news from social media. <laughs> yeah. So I'm add not that surprised. to the mix. Yeah, yeah, I'm not surprised. So I'm getting, honestly, this has been amazing, guys. I'm just gonna open it up to uh, the, the, uh, the audience, I guess. Um, if you want to ask a message, you can uh, ask a question. You can just uh, type something into chat, and I think I should be able to see it. And just while I'm waiting for you guys to do that, I'm going to ask the panelists if they've got any closing thoughts or anything else you'd like to share that we didn't uh, cover well enough. Speak to Laura and Nancy. That's my advice. That's what I'm going to do. Seriously. <laughs> I think that's what they're talking about. It's amazing how people. That, that's it's amazing how, how many people actually don't know what they're talking about in this space. You know, you know we're, we're, we talk about false false information, but there's also false expertise, and um, there's a lot of false expertise in this. That's why important. you were all invited onto this call because I knew that you knew your stuff. I didn't just randomly roll a dice. I knew that you guys were the top. So thank you very much for taking part. So I'm not seeing, I don't know if, I'm not seeing any questions come through yet. So I don't know if. Uh... Can I ask a question then? I want to ask a question. Okay, what's happening, 2023, what's the, what's the threat? We, we know what, we, we've been looking backwards, we're looking around us. 2023, is, do we do we have a picture and an understanding of what that means? I mean, because really, I mean, what changed everything for me was, was the Trump regime and their use of false, you know, false news and Twitter and all that sorts of thing, the capital invasion, all that sort of stuff. Um, I mean, that was game changing, or was it just a historical anomaly and it's going to be gone and we forget about it? And I'm really interested to know what the, the post truth environment looks like. Oh, guys, you just need to look south of the border. Uh, the US didn't invent Trump, we've been having Trump in Mexico for the last like 20 years of our life, and you can see that replicated across LATAM. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, as, as a Long-standing PR specialist, I've been taught not to ask, answer speculative questions, right? But I would say that maybe Trump is more of a symptom of the problem than the, the cause of the problem. And I don't know how, I mean, you have accessible channels, democratized media, you've got, everyone has, everyone has a voice, You've got voice, you've got velocity, you can create volume, and not everyone cares about veracity. And I don't see that changing in the next three or four years. So I don't know what it looks like, but it's a little bit scary. <laughs> I, mean, I made a classic communication mistake because I basically, my, my question was, was really, I really am interested to know what the threat's gonna look like or what the situation's gonna look like in a couple of years time. Um, and then I introduced Trump, which of course became, which you should never do, never, never create, introduce a distractionary issue. But I'm, I'm interested in two years' time. I mean, are we in a, because I'm getting stuff from supposedly from my bank, which looks like it's from my bank, asking me to click on a link. I'm getting stuff which looks like it's coming from the government or looks like it's coming from my kid's school and they know my name and they know my kid's name and it's coming from the school. What does post truth look like? That's the question I wanted to ask. Maybe I can add my my thoughts about this uh, topic because um, the, the the main the main driver for all changes are technological shifts. So you experience a lot of new technologies like deepfake technology, um, social media bots, and something like this. And I think that um, if we 
we can expect that these um, uh, developments will continue, that uh, these uh, tools will uh, democratize, to be democratized uh, further, so that everybody can use a deep fake, everybody can use a social media bot. Um, and I think at some point in time, you will have a situation where bots will talk to bots on social media, because uh, there are uh, activists out there that will use social media bots to, to make a, a, um, a campaign against your company and you as a company will use bots to uh, respond to that uh, campaign of activists. Uh, so, and you will have a situation where 99% of all messages on Twitter will be from bots and there's only 1% of real users that will read all these <laughs> information. That will be a, one I, I, situation I can really think that might come. Yeah, and on this subject, and <laughs> on deep fakes, which are real and present, and you're correct that that technology is being democratizing and they sound really scary. The real problem about deep fakes isn't that they exist. It's it's something that we describe as called the liar's dividend, is that they make you question things. So if mm -hmm. you can't trust one thing, how can you trust anything else, right? And deep fakes are currently really good ones, are really hard to make, but there's other versions of deep fakes. We call them cheap fakes like slap a company's logo on something and make it look like it's there it's imposter content spread it around does it look like this happened in the uk with a um department store called woolworth a teenager in his in, like i think he was like 15 for a project renamed his twitter account made it look like it was this department store from the 80s that was coming back started tweeting and literally everybody fell for it because he used the right logo no one bothered to call the company that still owns the trademark for the department store, whether they were coming back. It was just, it drove, again, emotions drive us. It drove itself through nostalgia, right? And that is an important distinction. And the other one that we forget to talk about is audio. We are particularly worried about voice notes and audio imposter content because it's really hard to verify. We have way more tools to verify either facts or images or videos, but not so many for audio. And if we're starting to shift towards a world where your face unlocks your phone, your voice unlocks your bank account, what does that then mean for future risks coming? Um, so I know that's at least, we are at first draft less worried about deep fakes and more worried about audio misinformation and what that means. Okay. okay. I've just got, I'm sorry, I, I would love to consider, because this, this is an area I find fascinating, but we've just got, um, we've got another question. And um, uh, this is from Thomas saying, how do you, how do you train your response to cancel culture and, and fake news stroke disinformation? So I guess how do you, how do you sort of train to deal with those, um, you know, attacks from activists and, uh, you know, stuff that might be untruthful? Um, I mean, I can jump in here a little bit. I mean, part of this is every situation is different but I think you have to make sure that you have the right process and controls in to see what's happening and understanding, you know, what the situation is, whether it's some form of social or digital threat, whether it's a statement and there's activations, I think there's lots of different ways, but you can't plan for every scenario, but you can help set up the decision-making process and determine in advance what types of activities would require action by a company. And setting up those processes to listen for events as they happen and then understand what you're willing to move on and what the decision-making process is, is how you approach that. But you use things like conductor and you use things like practicing in advance to build that muscle memory so when the real situation happens, you can quickly figure out a plan because essentially there is no time to go back and start at the beginning or to quickly respond. So that's how we approach it. Thank you very much, Nancy. I'm gonna wrap it up now because we're at the end of our hour. I wanna thank all of you for being such fabulous uh, panelists. Thank you very much and sharing your expertise and, and your time. And um, uh, I hope that uh, everybody that uh, attended today will continue the conversation with you directly because um, all your contact details are on the on the BCI website and thank you to the BCI for hosting us. You can actually um, go to our website to get a copy of the of the report for free and uh, you don't have to give up any personal information. You can just go to that um, URL conductor.com resources and then you can 
find the reputational risk report. So thank you very much, everyone. It's uh, been a pleasure and uh, I'll see you again some other time. Bye.